All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to talk about why we need to sort ourselves out first. And I'm going to try to give the deepest and also the most real answer that I can give, that I can find the courage to give. So let's get started. As I already mentioned many times on this channel, Jordan Peterson has been a big influence in my life. And one of the most influential videos that Jordan Peterson has made is my message to millennials how to change the world properly. And what he talks about there is basically the idea that if you want to change the world, you need to sort yourself out first. And uh, then he goes about how to do that. Uh, on one hand, he recommends reading the, the classics, uh, learning to read and to write and to think. And then he, uh, he also recommends his future authoring suite. About one year ago, his book 12 Rules for Life came out and there there is a rule that talks about that again, it's rule number six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And this is one of the core messages of Jordan Peterson and, and one of the main reasons I would argue why people find him so compelling and also the source of many funny memes like, like this one. But how should we understand this? Uh, why, why should you sort yourself out first? One of the way he explains it is by quoting Solzhenitsyn, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. But in my opinion, we have the opportunity to make this a bit more concrete and a bit more real. Let's start with a drawing. So imagine that this is society and there is some form of pattern going on in society. I don't know, some kind of corruption, some kind of cut that goes through society and that is problematic. The, the crucial observation now is to realize that society is made out of subsystems and each of these subsystems is then made out of individuals. So this line that cuts through society basically in one way or another cuts through all the individuals that are part of it. And don't worry we are going to make this more concrete. But let's look at what kinds of systems we are talking about. On one hand, you have the civilization as a whole. Then you have the society you are living in. Then you have the state, you have your workplace, you have your family, you have your individual relationships, and in the end, yourself, because you are a complex system on your own. Now to understand the situation a bit better, we have to move to, to another thing that Jordan Peterson emphasizes a, a lot, which is truth. He always says that the, one of the most important things to do in life is to tell the truth or at least not to lie, which is basically rule number eight of his book. How is this related to this whole discussion? Let's look again at the system of a whole. If you think about this system as a, con as a human construction, this is basically a system built by human its civilization. Now each system is going to be limited. And so there is going to be something outside of the system and that thing is basically reality. So imagine that there is some kind of reality here and here is civilization. And civilization basically is an attempt of human beings to, to survive within reality. And so reality is where kind of the danger of civilization collapsing comes from. So from reality there are certain dangers coming in the way of civilization. Now what would an adaptive system do? It would sense the danger and then integrate it into the system. And so the system would adapt to the new information and continue surviving. But now we, if we look at this situation specifically, what, what we see is that there is one or a few individuals, a few nodes of the system who sensed the new reality first, who sensed the danger coming. And by definition, this danger is something that was outside of the system, outside of the paradigm. So these people sensed something that was not fitting. Now imagine if these individuals had been afraid to tell the truth. They would have been affected by the danger, but the, the system as a whole wouldn't have been able to learn. And so the system here would have started to crumble basically. And if this goes on for too long, the system collapses. And this is the link between the truth that can only arise at the level of individuals who sense something that doesn't fit and the well-being of the whole. And now we have to talk about corruption. Corruption is basically what led these poor people not being able to tell the thing that they were sensing. So this is why corruption is not wanting to hear the truth. And corruption can happen at many levels. For example, we have at the level of the state authoritarianism. The citizens say something that doesn't fit, the state disappears the citizen. But then 
corruption can happen at the level of society, which is what happens with taboos, right? The people say something that people don't want to hear and society reacts and ostracizes uh, the people. But corruption can also happen at the level of the individual, which is what basically shame represents. So you have some thoughts that are not okay and you're ashamed of them and you repress them. So these are all ways in which the truth cannot come up and therefore stays bottled in. And then the reality that is behind the truth starts basically degrading the system. Now let's talk about courage. Truth is inevitably linked to courage because again, as we said, if there is a truth that needs to be said, it's because it's not part of the system. So the system will resist it, whatever level we are talking about. So let's look again at what happens to individuals within a system. So imagine that you are here and there are certain people around you or other systems that you are part of and there is some kind of mistake you know some kind of some kind of pattern that is not adaptive anymore and as we said this pattern pervades everyone in one way or another and now you sense you sense that there is something that's not fitting right let's assume that you are integrated enough so that you can accept this discomfort and you stop playing the game so you stop providing the signals to the people around you that fit this basically this collective illusion now what happens is that these people the people that are around you will notice that you're, you stop playing the game and they will react in one way or another they could react in one way which is to integrate the new signal right to talk to you and to kind of find the solution maybe negotiate something maybe you your signal was way too strong and and like your truth was biased most likely it is biased but people can kind of interact with you and this would strengthen the relationship and also strengthen the system or they can kind of cut you out and if they cut you out it is a danger to you but it is also danger to them because now there is a hole in the system so to tell the truth presents risks at all levels at, at the individual level you might recognize that you have been doing something wrong all along and it takes courage to admit that you might lose relationships you might lose your job you might lose your reputation. You might be persecuted by society and or by the state. So people in different circumstances walk around in the world with truths that are a danger to them. And I would argue that the sense danger of speaking your truth is proportional to the fragility of the system you're in. If you can admit to your truth and you admit you have done something wrong and then you tell the per and then you tell the person who was affected by that that you apologize and the solution is found then that's only a certain degree of fragility. But if you know that if you tell the other person, the other person will either ostracize you or, I don't know, you as a family will be persecuted or, you know, like this uh, is a sick sign that the system you're in is somehow corrupt. But then we can turn this around. If you find the courage to speak your truth, you are automatically strengthening the system you are in. And now let's, um, let's provide an example. James Amor criticized the diversity practices at Google and he was fired. And this was a big risk for him. I think he's probably still looking for a job one or two years later. But this allowed other people at least to see that there is something weird going on. And so he strengthened society as a whole. So for example, me, I can point to something and point to him. And so I am a bit safer addressing these issues and the fact that other credible people like professor steven pinker or professor brett weinstein have rung up to support him again like has made it a bit safer for everyone else to talk about these issues don't be misled each of these actions was an action of courage because these people wouldn't have had to do it and they did it because they saw something and they expressed it and um, they might be wrong but this is the process through which civilization is saved. So let's make it a bit more concrete. Let's talk about my own things that I sense in my life that are not completely sorted out. So one thing that I am struggling with is um, shame around my body. What, what does that mean? Um, when I look down, I see some fat down here. And I already feel kind of a bit of danger in the sense that some people will say, what, why are you even complaining about that? You're perfectly fit, right? But the feeling that I have is real, right? So, and I'm actually struggling with it. And it's interesting because I have not sorted out whether it's actually a good feeling, right? Because it is healthy to be healthy, right? Um, but is it healthy to feel bad if I have a bit of fat around my belly? So you see, this is something that is like there. This, like everything else that I'm going to talk about, is something that I haven't sorted out. That's why I'm kind of mentioning 
it a bit tentatively. And um, basically, these are kind of some personal taboos that I'm breaking. Another thing that I sometimes feel shame about, but I've worked a lot on that, is my lack of conscientiousness. So I often say I'm going to do this and then after a while I lose interest and I do something different. So I'm, uh, I have a hard time committing to something. And uh, luckily I am now within a, an environment where these things are being talked about a bit more. I know that this is a personality trait so I don't have to feel as ashamed about it as before. And this goes back to kind of how saying these things strengthens society as a whole because maybe now you uh, hearing this, you are struggling with something similar, uh, you can at least overcome a bit of the shame uh, and perhaps uh, like integrate this and maybe one day we will be able to go to a job interview and say I'm low in conscientiousness but I compensate with these other things. I don't know, maybe that the but is already uh, a sign of the shame. I don't know, you know, you see like we this is pushing the edge of how society works. Another thing is consumption of meat. This is something that keeps popping up when I think, okay, how could I really improve my life? I consume meat and I consume a lot of it and I do it mainly because I want to be, I don't know, muscular, fit, that kind of thing. And I like it. And, uh, but I feel that, yeah, poor animals suffering and dying because of that. And I'm conflicted about this. There is one thing that I'm still not sure about is whether it's a purely ethical issue. Um, I'm not sure about whether it's ultimately healthy to become vegan because in the end that's the consequence if you really want to stop uh, mistreating animals and um, I don't know the answer and this again opens kind of a rabbit hole of shame of values and even of the mechanisms through which uh, society like science creates knowledge and society then adapts the knowledge right why are we in a situation where each diet is its own religion, you know, like it shouldn't be this way, right? We should have a mechanism that produces reliable truth about these things. One that I'm struggling with a lot, it might be like the biggest problem of my life, is uh, how to deal with feelings of dislike in a relationship. What does that signal mean? If a feeling of dislike means you should break up with that person, then it's a completely different life than if the feeling of dislike means, okay, you have to work on it and improve the relationship, right? Like, and again, it's my problem. It's a problem that I struggle with um, and that is kind of self-reinforcing, right? Because then these signals become amplified because I don't know what the answer is and all these anxiety and fears grow. And who knows, perhaps this is part of a bigger taboo or a bigger problem that we have in society right now uh, where you have on one hand, you have Tinder, where you just swipe and, and you dump the person and maybe that's the future, maybe that's the solution, right? You really just stay with the person you, know, you, you like until you like the person and then it's over. Or maybe it's time to go back to a more conservative and maybe it's even better if you can delegate the, the question of who you're going to stay with to your parents, right? They, they, they just put you together with someone and you don't have to ask the question, right? So you see like there is a level of suffering that is here at my individual level and perhaps it is only my problem, but perhaps it has to do with uh, the fact that my parents divorced when I was three and like how did they solve the problem of disliking your partner? So you see how, again, like this is something that is very personal, very intimate, and I feel shame around it, but it might have to do with the whole of society. Another element is the feeling of dislike, of uncomfort, of just being with other people. I like spending time with people if we are working together to achieve a goal. But then just being, you know, just being with them and authentically interact, especially if it's a group of people, I don't feel at ease with that. And then the question is, is this a sign of the fact that I'm addicted to something more engaging like uh, social media? And then again, like if maybe if I manage to solve this problem and find the right values, uh, other people might benefit from that because so many people are affected and addicted to social media gaming and so on, right? And just being with people is boring. Why? Why is it boring, right? Is it maybe the future is really that? Uh, why should you spend time with your neighbor that you have nothing in common with other than the shared space? Uh, maybe it's much better to join online communities, or maybe we are losing something. So again, like having the courage to talk about these things. Um, and to kind of overcome this shame is the starting point. That's basically it. This is why 
we need to sort ourselves out first. And um, I hope you will join the project. Thank you for watching. See you next time.